You say that you're okay, but you've been holding on for dear life. So many years of rain, you can't remember what the sunshine feels like. Inside you're hurting, you're worried, you're not deserving of a lifeline. Oh, but the hands that hold the stars say you are. Good morning, New Life family. Jessica here with this week's announcements. Our next membership class is coming up on June 7th. We call it Growth Track 101. If you would like to find out more about the Free Methodist Church and what we look like, or would like to be interested in becoming a member, please let me know so we can prepare the materials. While Growth Track is going on on June 7th, the rest of us are going to be taking advantage of Tom Gardner's Adventure Center. This is a fun experience for adults and teens to learn some new skills and practice some team building exercises. It is a lot of fun. Hope you can join us. June 11th will be our annual church picnic. We'll be hosting it right after the morning worship service in our own backyard here on the campus. The church will be providing hamburgers and hot dogs and all the fixings to go along. There will be a sign up for you at the welcome desk to bring a dish to pass. Whether it's a side or a dessert, all will be enjoyed. And if you have any yard games you would like to bring, I'm sure there will be lots of people who would enjoy playing those as well. Again, June 11th is our annual church picnic. June 18th is Father's Day, and here at New Life, we'll be celebrating our dads with pie, for pop. That's right, we're going to have pies, homemade, store-bought, whatever we have. We'll be there to enjoy with our dads as we celebrate you and all you do in our families. If you are able and willing to bring a pie to share, please sign up at the welcome desk. Graduation Sunday is June 25th, and if you know anyone who's graduating from either high school or college, we would like to honor them. Please let me know if you have any candidates. Tithes and offerings can be given many ways. You can put your tithes and offerings in the plate as it is passed around at the end of service. You can also put them in the box located at the back of the sanctuary or technology, you can text GIVE to 315-325-8080. That's all for this week's announcements. Have a great week. This week's scripture reading is John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. This is God's word. Imagine being the guy in heaven who Jesus spit on. I mean, he just spits on the ground, makes mud and puts it on his eyes. I think when I get to heaven, I'm going to look at that guy and go, really, what went down there? Did they kind of take some poetic liberty in this whole story or what? Well, I like to watch English mystery programs, crime programs, and they're, they're all kind of the same, but they're really good. Their characters are just so much better than ours. Have you ever seen a police station in an American like TV show? Everybody's a supermodel. I think if police were really like that, I would just get arrested to hang out with them. I mean, they're all this just, just stunning, beautiful supermodel kind of people. In England, their programs, I don't know if they have the same kind of pool of actors that we have or something, but they all seem much more realistic. But in the programs, what always happens is the star always puts their job before anything else. Uh, they're solving you know, murder mysteries. Therefore, they, their, their home life is usually horrific. They're never there. They're always at work. There's always this tension and anxiety and struggle between being at work, protecting society from the chaos of crime, and then their home life is just awful. And as we look today, we're going to look into two different things that Jesus is going to kind of bring to the, to the forefront in what we're going to see we're going to look at this whole idea of what it's like to, to go through personal suffering. 
Or what is it like to be spiritually blind? And what happens is when we put something that's good into, into a position that, uh, is, that, that is reserved for the great, when we make an idol out of something, which we all do, what happens is we become blind to other things in our life. Just as those detectives who put their career before their family, they become blind to the fact that their family needs attention. And so we're going to look into this idea today that when we promote something that's good into something that great, it leads us into an idea of spiritual blindness. Now, as we look at that passage, first fill in the blank, is Jesus deals with our first thing is personal suffering. Now, the disciples are going up to Jesus at this time, and they're saying, why, what, why is this person born blind? Did he sin? Or did someone else sin in this family or something like that. And a lot of people say, well, he's looking into the concept of karma, which Christianity doesn't really support that whole, whole idea whatsoever. But what they're really talking about is a pharisaical concept or a doctrine that it is possible to sin in your womb. Okay, don't send me an email about that, right? Because we don't, we don't really get into that. We don't really believe that. So they're saying, why is this person suffering? Is it Someone else's fault, or is it his fault? Was it his parents' fault, or was it his fault? And we often ask these questions. And we often have similar responses. Why am I in pain? Why is that person in pain and I am not? Or why are they having great and I don't? Your next fill in the mind. Because we often respond with, our first response is normally pride. When personal suffering comes into our lives, we usually begin this idea as, I deserve what? Something better. I deserve better. I don't deserve this. Why is this happening to me? Doesn't God understand how great I am? And what the problem is with that is we really have too high of a view of ourselves. Yesterday, I, well, this morning, I performed a miracle uh, by praying, and then our sound system was fixed. Actually, Jesus performed the miracle through me, but I'll take credit for it. No, I'm only kidding. I prayed, and it worked. But anyway, yesterday, I performed a miracle in my house. Um, I got a, you know, information came to me on Friday that our washer machine was broken. Yeah. I mean, God forbid you got to go to the laundry mat. Things just, well, washing machine's broken. I had a lot going on. The last two weeks have been super, super busy. So we actually said, you know what? We've had this washing machine forever. I think it was actually given to us. And it's like, let's just get a new one. We looked at used ones, and it was like, by the time I go get them and install, let's just get a new one. So we're looking at new ones because they're, they're on sale because it's Memorial Day and everything like that. So we're looking at them. We're looking around, and it's like, ah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really cheap, by the way. So yesterday, I did some work in the morning and the afternoon. I looked at a YouTube video. And this guy's like, if, this, if your washing machine's doing this, this is most of the, most of the way this fix. It takes five minutes. And lo and behold, it took me five minutes, and it's fixed. And as you can see, my clothes are washed today and everything. So I go down there, and of course I have to have my wife there to hold the light because I want her to witness this magic that I do when I break out my tools. So I, I take out the screwdriver. There's a little switch. I put a tie wrap on it. I put it back together. Boom. Washer machine is fixed. And she is like, you're awesome. And I'm like, I am. And then she's like, this is amazing. And I'm like, of course it is. I'm a magician. So, and, then, and then she immediately went and threw laundry in the washing machine and started doing laundry. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? She's like, I'm doing laundry. I'm like, no, no, no. We got to like have a parade. You know, you got to like lift me up on my shoulder and carry me around. So, and she's like, I got to get the laundry done. And I'm like, yeah, but I fixed it. You know, so I was like, well, what am I going to do? So I walked upstairs, and I announced to everybody else in the house that I fixed the washing machine, and they weren't very impressed. So I went to Home Depot, and, you know, I walked into Home Depot, and they're like, how are you today? I'm like, how am I today? I fixed the washing machine today. And they were like, oh, my goodness. They announced over the loudspeaker, Chris Mishagna's here. He fixed the washing machine. I walked down an aisle, and I'm like, I'm still, I'm like, you don't understand. I fixed the washing machine 
we're going to buy a new one. And I be- ran into somebody. I've only met this guy like three times. And I'm like, how's it going? He's like, good. How are you doing? I'm like, how am I doing? What are you fixing? Well, I'm fixing an awning in my backyard. I fixed the washing machine today. And he was like, oh my goodness. They lifted me up on their shoulders. So I got home and I worked on something else. And I kept reminding my wife. I'm the guy that fixed the washing machine. She was like, yeah, that was great. That was like three hours ago. What's the big deal? I'm like, it's a huge deal. And we think we're like that as human beings, by the way. And by the way, that's kind of how my psyche works. Sorry, you might want to leave. But it, we all think that way. We all have this huge high view of ourselves of how great we are and how much we give and, how much, and all this stuff. And we're really not. We're just people. And we're broken. And we say things like, we don't deserve this. Well, we'll look at it a little bit later, and we've looked at it plenty of times before. We actually deserve it. We actually deserve worse. So we often come across this idea, I just don't deserve this. You know who I am? You know what I've done? So we either respond with pride, or next, this next fill in the blank, is we respond in blame. They deserve it. And we do this all the time when we see tragedy or something or someone gets sick or something and we we somehow need to rectify it and justify it in our minds why that's happening. Oh, you know, it's... They, they did this or not that and they wouldn't... This wouldn't have happened. That's what happens when you do that, you know? You reap what you sow. Really? I spoke just a few days ago to a person who works in an inner city school district and the, just the, the, the injustice of a child going to a school where they're basically ending up Functionally illiterate. It's just overwhelming. That three miles from here, kids go through an educational process and just come out functionally illiterate. And how just the injustice of that. And we all have our ways of dealing with it. If you lean towards the right, you say, well, family breakdown. You know, that, that family thing, all right, oh, everything right. Then if you lean a little bit more towards the left, you go, oh, systematic injustice, uh, racism or injustice. But n- nobody blames the kids. And they're the victims. And we somehow blame, and we somehow put into the situation some way where we justify it in our minds from happening. Well, if that happened to me, oh. So we usually respond in personal suffering with pride, I don't deserve this, or blame, they deserve that. Or three is we ignore it. We say, who cares? We close our eyes and glad it's not me. Stinks to be you. We just go along with our lives. Well, there's a passage in Luke chapter 13. We've looked at it before. I'll read it to you. It says, there were some present at that time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered in this way? And this is Jesus speaking. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And what they're saying is, Hey, Jesus, these Galileans, Pilate mingled, butchered them. Why'd that happen? Jesus goes, are you blaming them? Do you think they're worse than you? Do you think they're worse than other Galileans? Do you think because they were so bad, that's why this bad thing happened to them? And their answer is probably yes. And Jesus goes, no, and you need to repent. You need to think about this totally different. And we need to think about personal suffering Totally different. 
differently than our fallen nature does, differently, different than our religious nature does. Then he goes on. He says, Or those 18 whom the tower of Siloam fell on, fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. And what he says, he says, hey, these people who were butchered or murdered by Pilate, you think that they were the worst people in their community and that's why it happened? So bad things only happen to bad people. Jesus says, no, and you need to think totally different. And he says, how about that tower that fell on those 18 people? Do you think that happened to them because they were the worst people in Jerusalem? And he says, no, you need to think differently. And what Jesus is saying is you need to get off with your pride horse and say, hey, I'm better. And you need to get off your blame horse and say they deserve it. And by the way, you need to get off your, ignore, uh, your I'm going to ignore this and pretend it's not happening. And he says you need to think differently. And as Christians, we are called to think differently about personal suffering. And we don't get prideful and say, oh, I'm a Christian, that doesn't happen to me. Or those people are really wicked and that can happen to them. Or who cares? It's too complex, I don't care. Christian says we, <laughs> Christian, Christ says we need to think differently. Why was that person born blind? To bring glory to God. By the way, that's why you and I were born. That's why everybody was born. That's why in the catechism it says, what is our purpose being human? It's to bring glory to God. Whether you were born blind, or whether you were born like Atlas, whatever you were born like whatever, or whether you were born wherever. The duty of humanity is to bring glory to God. And when we engage personal suffering and we see people involved in personal suffering, we must think differently. We do not suffer because of our personal sin. There's a huge difference between being punished for our sins and being chased while we're in it or corrected by God in it. God never in one of those points begins to bring vengeance down upon us. That's not why we go through personal suffering. And most of the time we will never know why someone is or why we go through personal suffering. What our job is, is to get involved and try to alleviate it. Because we don't know why it's happening. And there are times where you want to pull your hair out and say, why, why, why? And the answer is, I don't think we will ever fully know. What our job is, is to say, I'm in this situation and I need to meet God in it and I need to glorify God in it. And what happens, and unless we understand that God is working in this for the betterment of humanity, and unless we understand that our job is to, to glorify God in it, and your next fill in the blank, is that we will often lead us to self-pity and anger. It will, if you don't realize that God is working in it, and that, listen, if, if we suffer for what we've done wrong, why did Jesus, Jesus suffer? He didn't do anything wrong. And if we suffer randomly, like God doesn't do anything, God hinges history on what, what Jesus went through. And if we don't see that God is working, that there's a mystery, and what we're called to do is glorify God in it, whether we're witnessing it or it's happening to us, we will either turn out 
with either I hate me, self-pity, or I hate thee, hatred of God. That's why it's so important. When we see someone who's suffering, that we don't give them antidotes. Maybe we just give them our time, our presence. When we're going through suffering, that we, we don't always just ask why, 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 but we look for God's presence in it. Job never got an explanation. Do you imagine God trying to explain that to Job? Okay, this is what's going to happen, Job. You've lost everything. You've lost all of your children. You've lost all of your wealth. You've lost all of your position in society. Matter of fact, you've lost your health. But you have to understand, suck it up. Billions of people will read what's happened to you and get comfort and solace and meet me through what you went through. Okay, so take heart now. And he's going to be like, what? Yeah, 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 there's going to be this book. They'll call it the Bible, and you're in it, and everyone's going to know your name. Job's like, oh, okay. How does, do you think he's going to understand that? But what does God give Job? You, you'll never understand what I'm doing. But I'm here. And I'm doing something that your mind can never even remotely figure out. And it might not be the total answer we want, but it is the best answer that you get this side of eternity from any faith or philosophy. So Jesus deals with our um, with personal suffering. He also deals with this idea of our spiritual blindness. And in verse 39 and 40 of that same chapter we went through, it says, For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. So the Pharisees near to him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus basically answers them by saying yes. Yes. And before we come to faith in, in Christ, we can sense. But we don't see. We're blind. We're spiritually blind. Now the Pharisees thought they saw, but Jesus is like, no, you don't. And I'm sure they were going like, I can see that. Jesus is like, yeah, but you need to understand that there is a form of sensor, there's a form of seeing that goes beyond just seeing the physical. There's something that goes beyond perception to realizing. And Jesus is like, you don't. You don't realize who I am. You see me, but you don't realize who I am. And many people see Christ, but they don't realize who he is. And they can kind of sense he's a good guy. Now, I'm not a farmer, but in my yard there are plants. And plants can sense things. They can sense rain, they can sense heat heat, they can sense cold, they can sense sunlight, and the lack of sunlight, and they respond to it. My grass goes dormant when there's a lack of sunlight. But if I walked up to uh, the plant with a light and I put it up to it, it wouldn't start going like this to try to get away from it. Or if I went up to it with some, I don't want to say roundup, but if I went up to it with some kind of weed killer, it wouldn't try to get away from it. But if I put it on, it it would sense it and it would eventually die. It can't see it, but it can sense it. 
before we are a Christian, we can sense certain things, but we don't fully see it. We can perceptionally maybe view it, but we don't have the realization of what's going on. And what's the difference there? The person who was born blind, when he saw Christ and understood Christ, what, what did he do? Worshipped him. What did the Pharisees do? Rejected him. The person healed from blindness when it was realized it was Jesus worshipped. Pharisees are like, we don't know who you are. We don't like you. We like the Moses guy because he's really far away and it's history and we can orchestrate that and we know how it outcome. We don't like the Jesus guy. And what are you with Jesus? Do you worship him? Do you like worshiping him? Because if you don't, it's because you don't see him. And you don't realize who he is. If worshiping Jesus is a pain in the neck to you, and you don't like it, it's because you don't fully realize what he did. When you realize what he did, you can't but say thank you. You can't but worship him. If you like serving Jesus more than worshiping him, it's probably because you can't really see him. You might sense he's a good guy and sense he did some nice things. You know, he tells people to get along and stuff like that. But when you see him for who he really is, you can't but worship him. That's one of the barometers we have. And by the way, it's easy to serve Jesus. You go to worship him? There's something that happens in your heart. It's called conversion. So when we get to see and our our spiritual blindness is open, we experience, this is your next one on the mic, we experience a realization of sin and grace. We see what is really going on inside of us. We see that our disobedience just isn't a whoopsie. We see this thing called sin. That it's this evil that lives inside each and every one of us, and it displays itself in behavior that's displeasing to God. And we begin to see that when we begin to see Jesus for who he really is. We see sin, and then we see grace. We see that we could be fully known in all of our brokenness and all of our evil, and we could be fully loved. At one time, we feel so irreprehensible to Christ. In another way, we feel so bonded and loved by Christ that we know that there is nothing we can do to separate us from the love that God has for us. And that's why we worship Him. That's why our acts are not just out of white-knuckling service, but they're out of love and appreciation for what Christ did for us. Last is our healing begins when we see the cross and worship. When we see the cross and we worship. Worship is so important. It lets us know, it's a barometer, where we're at with God. And do we really understand what Jesus did for us? My wife comes from Jefferson County, and to get to my in-law's house, you have to drive over 177, where all the windmills are. We have relatives who live in the shadow of one of those huge windmills, you know? And uh, the fellow's 
really a neat guy. He's a big football fan. He says, it's really weird. During the fall, during football season, he goes, I'll be watching a game. It happens once a season. And he says, the windmill lines up with the sun. And all of a sudden, my living room turns into a big strobe light. Imagine that. You know, and he says, it's, it, it, you see the shadow just. And I remember as a kid one time, I was playing baseball in the summer league. It was the middle of summer. And it just so happened I was in, we're standing there getting warm ups, and a plane flew by. And you could see the shadow of the plane go across the field. And literally, our center fielder kind of went like this. And I heard a story last week about a pastor who's driving home from his wife's funeral with his two sons. And they were driving down the highway. And they drove by a truck. And the shadow of the truck was cast on the car. And the pastor's driving the car, heartbroken. And his one son, older son, says to his younger son, would you rather get hit by the shadow of the truck or the truck? The son goes, what? And he goes, would you rather get hit by the shadow of a truck or by the truck? And he goes, the shadow of the truck. The son goes, yeah. Mom got hit by the shadow of the truck. Because Jesus got hit by the truck from mom. The, de- the sting of death is sin. And for a Christian, death for us is we get hit by the shadow of sin, of death. We get hit by the shadow of death as a Christian because Christ got hit by the truck for you and for me. And if that doesn't make you worship him, I don't know what will. But that's the God we serve. He didn't throw down a bunch of ideas from heaven, say, try this out, guys. He didn't throw down a book and say, now you obey that. He didn't say, here's my life for an example for you. What he said is, I'm going to get hit by a truck so that when you go through death, you'll be hit by the shadow of the truck. And all he asks us to do is worship him? To say thank you? If we can't do that, we don't understand who we're serving. And we're spiritually blind. If we could come in on an hour on Sunday and scream our heads off and say, thank you for getting me by the truck so I don't have to, we don't understand what we're, who we're worshiping. We don't understand who our God is. Has God opened up your eyes? who he is? Have you gotten a glimmer to see who Jesus is and what he's done for you? When he's done all that for us and he asks us to do certain things to obey him, out of love and appreciation, I think he could ask us anything. So here's some next steps for this week. This week I will ask God to forgive me and be Lord of my life. I don't know if that's you this week. Check that. And you want to talk, I'd love to talk to you about it. Or this week, I'll ask God, let me have a realization. Let me not just see you, let me perceive you. Let me not just sense you. Our God is so much more than a power. Let me have an interaction with you. God, let me have a realization.
Or this week, if that's you, check that. If this week I'll ask God, show me what you did for me and help me worship you. Maybe you need God to remind you and give you a realization of the cross and of grace and of true love. So check one of those and let's pray together. Lord, thank you that we get to worship a living God who's done something we could never do for ourselves or nobody in humanity could do for us. Thank you for getting hit by the truck of death so we only have to experience the shadow. Lord, help us to really realize how big you are and how amazing you are and how broken we are, but loved. And Lord, as we made a check next to one of these prayers this week, meet with us all in a very special way. We pray this in Christ's name. Everyone said, amen. Jessica? This week's ministry moment is about ways for you to serve. There's so many opportunities for you to serve, and a lot of you have stepped up to help out. And we're looking for, still looking for, people that would like to serve in the nursery. If you would like that, see me. We need people, always need people on the worship team to help out. And if that's what interests you, please see Jessica. If you're interested in technology and videoing or uh, typing up the PowerPoint slides, any of that technology stuff, being on the technology team, please see Mike. If you're interested in first impressions on a weekly basis or once a month, we could use you as a greeter or an usher or in hospitality or setting up communion. So if you're interested in any of these opportunities to serve, please see me. And we appreciate all the help.